Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the ongoing COVID-19 uh, vaccine video series that um, we are producing in an effort to bring you the latest and best information of this uh, ongoing, what we hope is the final stage of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm very pleased to be joined this afternoon by Glenn Rawl, who is a familiar face to nearly everyone in this audience. He is the Chief uh, Academic Officer at Fox Chase Cancer Center and the recently appointed Assistant Dean for Faculty Affairs at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine. Glenn, I hope they gave you a new pillow for your chair when you took on, took on that role, and is also a, a co-author of Principles of Virology, which is now in its fifth edition and is the standard textbook uh, in the field. And I wanted to bring Glenn in today because uh, there's a lot going on, a uh, fair amount of headlines, fair amount of discussion, and uh, Glenn, I think, has always brought a unique perspective uh, to what we're dealing with. And Glenn, I want to just kick it off um, with a broad question. You know, where are we in the in the pandemic? Like, wh what are you seeing? What can you give us? You know, thirty thousand feet of where we are. Sure. Well, hello, Jeremy. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, so let's start with good news. Actually, um, the number of new cases of SARS-CoV-2 infections is dropping. Um, in the last week or so, it's dropped by about 35%, which is appreciable. Um, and that corresponds with a reduction in the number of hospitalizations too. So that's terrific. That is certainly something worth celebrating. And that might be attributable to a few things. Um, it could be um, that people are beginning to really understand the importance of masks and the uh, ways in which we protect ourselves, not only from getting infected, but from giving the virus perhaps to, to other people, especially since some of the rancor that was part of the politics of all of this has ebbed um, a bit um, over, over the last few weeks. I think it may also partly be the fact that the holidays are behind us. Um, lots of folks get together. This was a, a hotbed for sharing viruses um, among you know, family members and friends. Now that we're into the cold, hard winter months where we're pretty much staying in our pods, um, I think that also contributes to it. But it might also be the fact that we're beginning to see the appreciable effects of herd immunity. So remember, herd immunity is this concept that when enough people have immunity to a particular pathogen, whether it's through natural infection or through vaccination, um, it provides fewer places for that virus to be able to go. It, it, there are fewer hosts in which it can replicate. And ultimately, that's going to be the end of this pandemic. Um, it's estimated that, I think, 27 and a half, I think I saw in Washington Post this morning, about 27 and a half million Americans um, have had either one or both doses of the two vaccines that are EUA approved. And it probably, although we have no real way of knowing this, so this is a very ballpark number, but probably about 100 million Americans have already had SARS-CoV-2. Um, even if they were asymptomatic, they still have antibodies to this. So this is beginning to get us closer to um, the percentages that we need to see in order to benefit from herd immunity rate. So that's good. All of those things are good. And these vaccines are out, more vaccines are coming, which I suspect we're going to talk about. All of those things are, are grand. But, and there's a, a, a substantial but, um, we said a year ago, a plus or minus, when we started doing these videos, specifically at Fox Chase and then more recently for the, the, the whole health system, that this is going to be like the stock market, right? There's going to be these daily changes and there are going to be trends <clears throat> over time. So trends that correspond with holidays, which we've already seen. And what we, what we should have learned this lesson by now is that when we sort of screw up when we disobey the, the, the requests to stay in your pod and to you know wear face masks and all the rest, this is when we see cases rebound. We saw it happen in the 4th of July. We saw it happen at Thanksgiving. We saw it happen at Christmas. This Sunday is the Super Bowl. 25% of people say that they're likely to go to a Super Bowl party. And I don't like being the guy that says that's a bad idea, right? It's not a whole lot of fun to say, don't get together with people that you love for holidays or you know, don't have nachos and yell at your television on, on Sunday. But, but part of the problem is if you're doing this with groups of people that you don't normally spend time with, 
and your mask is off because you're having a good time and eating food and drinking and all the rest, this is exactly the hotbed that is a problem for spreading these viruses. And here in the, I'll, I'll keep with the football metaphor, in the last quarter, this is not the time to screw this up, right? If you've managed to make it through this painful year so far, this is now not the time to screw this up. Um, the United States has been, and this is not my opinion, this is just true, the United States has been a relative disaster in managing COVID relative to other countries, right? We consistently rank in the bottom five or 10% based on a variety of different metrics that are published by uh, reputable groups. Um, and actually, I looked this up for today. We were supposed to be recording this video yesterday. Now we're recording it today. In the interval between yesterday and today, there were 15,000 deaths in the world as a result of coronavirus, plus or minus, of which 4,000 of those deaths occurred in the United States. That's about a quarter, despite the fact that the United States has 4% of the world's population. So for whatever reason, and it certainly is many reasons, we continue to struggle with containing this virus until enough of us have gotten the vaccine and are fully protected. So, um, and, and even when it comes, I, I'm kind of babbling, but I'm the only guy you got, I'm sorry today. But one of the other concerns that I'm gonna screen share for just a second is there's also a surprisingly large number of individuals who are choosing not to get the vaccine. So this is from, I think it's the New York Times last week. Um, this is a screenshot of obviously the United States, here it comes, um, of the United States where the darker the blue, the more likely a particular group, and it's obviously broken up by county, is likely to get vaccinated, right? And the lighter the blue, the closer it is to this, you know, sort of teal color or, or you know, kind of pale green color, you're down to about a 50% chance of individuals. So this is kind of terrifying, right? I mean, here we are in Philadelphia, right down in here, which is, you might look at that and say, okay, you know, go Philly, go Monco and Bucks County, it looks pretty, pretty dark blue. But remember, these viruses don't abide by county or by state demographics, right? And the entire country, there still is a huge amount of vaccine skepticism, one presumes, um, in the middle part of this country and even in parts of the country that are somewhat coastal here, including New Jersey and in, in places. So some of these things give me kind of cause for concern. There's the good news that rates are falling, but there's the bad news that the number of cases continues to go up. 4,000 deaths in the last day is, um, is tragic. So it's a bit of a two-headed monster here in terms of whether you see this from a, you know, a good perspective or a bad perspective. You know, one of the things that's been causing a lot of concern among the public is variants, mutations and variants. Can you uh, give us some guidance about the best way to think about that? Well, we talked about the last time. I mean, if, for those people who are, uh, you know, kind of regular watchers for this, um, Heather and I talked quite a bit about what these variants are and and, and a little bit of comfort here that they're entirely predictable. There, there, no virologist is surprised that variants would emerge. And there's all sorts of reasons why those things occur. But if you can imagine, if you have this population in which all of a sudden you have a variant that grows better than the parent from which it was derived, that eventually over time, person to person, that, that variant that has just a little bit of a replication edge over the parent strain is going to outcompete the parent. That is not surprising. This happens in virus studies constantly. It's how viruses evolve. It's populated whole fields of virology. So that's not so surprising. What I think we have to bear in mind is that some of these variants have perhaps relevance in terms of vac vaccine efficacy or concerns about um, the severity of disease that we can get from. Um, but one of my worries is that I think a lot of us tend to think in a very binary way, right? That if I get infected by this variant, then the vaccine is not gonna be effective. It either, either the vaccine works or the vaccine doesn't work. Or, although I haven't heard this as frequently, if I get this vaccine, I'm gonna be much more likely to be put onto a ventilator or to die from this, from, from this variant than from the parental strain. And those are wrong. 
um, the variant may have an advantage over the parental strain in terms of its growth, but it's pretty subtle. And there isn't strong evidence yet that these variants should you get infected with one of them. And there are a couple of them that are circulating. There's the South African, there's the Brazilian strain, there's the one that originated in Kent in England. Um, they all have their kind of nuances, but there's no strong, strong evidence that you will suffer a worse course of COVID if you're infected with one of these variants than another. Um, I think one of the things that is very alarming to people is whether the vaccines that were developed against the parent strain are effective against the variant strains. Um, and, and there was a report that came out, um, it was a peer reviewed published report, so therefore I think it has some credibility that, it, that the uh, RNA based vaccines are perhaps six times less effective um, in protection against the variant than the parental. And if you hear that, you're like, yikes, that seems like a substantial reduction. But remember how good these vaccines are, right? It's the reason why we're even telling people who once had COVID still get your vaccine because it increases your neutralizing antibody levels, substantial orders of magnitude over what the natural infection could do. So you know that I like metaphors, so I, I, I have a metaphor. And the metaphor is, I take my kid to, I don't know, the boardwalk and she wants to go in and buy candy at a candy store and she asked me for money. And I say, okay, honey, here's $6,000. And my wife comes up and says, that's a lot of money. Why don't you cut that back by sixfold? And I give her $1,000 to go into the candy store. I promise you my kid still has plenty of money to buy all the candy that she wants. So the point is, even if this vaccine is, is less effective, against these variants, it's still pretty damn effective. And so I think for us to get super, super anxious about how these variants are gonna impact the quality of the, the vaccines that we have is at best premature and perhaps alarmist because we don't have strong evidence of this. It certainly is not a reason to consider not getting a vaccine or to hopefully wait for a vaccine that's gonna address all possible variants to arise because that is not in the offing. That's not going to happen. You know, your comment about the candy store segues, segues very nicely into what I wanted to ask you next. You know, we now have more than messenger RNA vaccines. We have a vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. It looks like it's going to be available pretty soon. There's a vaccine from AstraZeneca that looks like it's going to be available soon. When the news of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine came out, the number that was trotted out was 66% efficacy. And I'm sure a lot of people saw that and said, no way, I'm not getting the one that's 66% effective. I'm, I want the one that's 95% effective. Can, can you talk about that? Like, how do we compare vaccines one to another? Right. So a couple things, just for a second, on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which I think is probably going to be the next one that gets emergency use authorization, AstraZeneca. And there are others that are, you know, kind of coming down the uh, coming down the pipeline here as well. But the J&J &J vaccine is actually quite different from either the Moderna or Pfizer, which are virtually identical minus a couple of little variations. This one is a single shot. So this one, you don't need to wait three weeks or four weeks and then come back and get your second one. The Johnson & Johnson is a single shot. It doesn't have all of the, you know, sort of peculiarities of the RNA vaccines that require ultra cold temperatures and, um, and all the rest. Um, and we can talk, probably not here, but we can talk at a later time or someone else can talk at a later time about what this vaccine is, how it's different. It's much more of a traditional vaccine uh, to other kinds of vaccines that are currently out there for different sorts of pathogens. It, what it is, is it's the spike um, RNA encoded in a non-replicating adenovirus. And so we've taken one protein or sorry, one gene of the SARS virus, the one that causes COVID, and we've spliced it, not we, meaning I've had nothing to do with, but it has been spliced into the adenovirus um, genome. This adenovirus doesn't replicate, it cannot make you sick. But what it does do effectively is ferry the, um, the SARS spike gene into cells, which we know from previous discussions like these is necessary in order for the spike protein to be made and for you to make an immune response to it. So Jeremy, you're exactly right, that, that it is estimated that the efficiency in protection against infection 
is slightly less than the other ones. And I would understand if people are like, oh, no, 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 don't give me the one that gets, it's only 65% protective. I want the one that's 95% protective. So I'm gonna now try to argue why you should still get the one that's 65%. Um, I've used analogies, I, like I've, I've run the risk of seeming silly by how excited and enthusiastic I, I am about the quasi miracle of developing multiple vaccines that are safe and that effective. This is, I'll keep using sports analogies even though I don't know anything about sports. This is equivalent to, you know, two successive innings at some baseball game in which there are grand slams. It is unbelievable that this has occurred, that Pfizer then followed by Moderna, these are truly grand slam events. And now you have Johnson and Johnson and now they hit a home run and you're like, yeah, not a grand slam. So your perspective about how effective these vaccines are is kind of skewed because of the remarkable success of these RNA vaccines. But 75%, whatever the percents are, it kind of differs depending upon where in the world the vaccine was deployed, a little bit better in the United States, a little less good in Latin America. This is still from a, a, a vaccine perspective, a remarkable success. Right? So don't look at these as in some way subordinate to the RNA vaccines. This is still remarkable. And what is most important is that all of these vaccines, the Merck, uh, sorry, not the Merck, the Johnson & Johnson, the Pfizer, the Moderna, all of these protect against, um, they reduce hospitalizations and deaths. They protect against severe disease, right? So in some way, what you want is this vaccine to protect you against the very things that we're most anxious about, the, the, in, the, the ventilators, serious long-term illnesses, death as a result of these infections. And in that case, all of them are equally effective. So that even if you do get infected following vaccination with let's say the J&J &J strain or the J&J &J vaccine, you're, the, the likelihood that you're gonna have severe disease is greatly, greatly diminished. So my honest advice is no matter what vaccine is offered to you, say yes, get that vaccine. And my prediction also is that as we recognize the need to vaccinate the world, not just you know Temple Health or Philadelphia or Pennsylvania, but the entire world, the RNA vaccines that are kind of finicky in terms of temperature sensitivity, they're not gonna be the things that are gonna be deployable in let's say Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia or in for, further to reach places. It's gonna be the one shot, hail and hearty Johnson and Johnson like vaccines that are gonna be ultimately the ones that are gonna get the world to that herd immunity rate that's gonna make this global pandemic go away. So um, yeah, my advice for certain is even if the efficacy is less, when you're offered a vaccine, accept that vaccine where I would tell you that shopping around makes some sense is if that vaccine was proven not to be as effective against severe illness, then that's a different conversation, but that is not where we are with respect to these vaccines. Well, that's super helpful, Glenn. As we were, um, as you and I were talking offline and thinking and preparing for this conversation, you, you placed a bunch of thoughts into what I'll call a bucket of concerns. So we'll ask the question this way, you know, what as you're thinking about this, and you're one of our leading thinkers internally, and I would argue externally as well, yeah. uh, what concerns you lately? Like, as, as you're watching this, what concerns you? Right. Yeah. So, um, right. I did actually come to you, Jeremy, and I said, I've got things that I think we're not talking about. And I think that might have been the catalyst for this, this video. So I, I'm kind of prepared. I'm looking over here at my notes. I've actually talked about a couple of them already. And because I don't want to just you know yammer on forever, I'll I'll just remind you and then we'll move on. One of the things is that we focus a lot on rates within the the the, the country. Um, so we all know that over 400,000 individuals in the United States have died of COVID. This is tragic, but I think fewer of us know how many people in the world have died of COVID. And this is not just my effort to sort of think globally and that we're all in this together. And but it is actually a stark reminder that when travel begins in earnest again, air travel, when people start going on vacations, remember these viruses don't understand nor obey um, country barriers. And so therefore 
you know, you're going to be in airports with people from other countries where their vaccine rate uh, acceptance rate is far less or lower than the United States. And that matters. We need to be able, not, not just because I think it's the right thing to do, but we actually need to be thinking about world rates, not just what's happening in our country or our county or our city or our health system. And that's why I think the simpler vaccines are going to be part of this success story moving forward in the next few months. Um, I've already talked about thinking too much in a binary way, right? We need to understand a bit more um, the nuances of how we think about numbers and how those numbers translate into actions that we might make. Um, I think this whole pandemic has been a lesson to all of us about how we calculate risk, right? So. Um, you know, maybe there are people who don't like needles. I don't like needles. I'd rather not have one put in my arm. But, but I talk to people who are anxious about getting the vaccine because of they don't like needles. It makes them kind of woozy. And, and it's this matter of balancing relative risks. Um, Jeremy, I, help me. I can't remember what I've talked about before. Have I, have I used the um, Senor Salsa uh, Abington Memorial Hospital analogy before? Not that one, no. Okay. That's new. Oh, real quick. On 611 near Fox Chase, Abington Memorial Hospital is on one side of the street, a Mexican restaurant called Senor Salsa is on the other side of the street. Here's my metaphor for this. If I work at Senor Salsa and I cut myself because I'm slicing up something and I am bleeding profusely and I'm standing on the Senor Salsa side of 611, a fairly busy street up here by Fox Chase, and Abington Hospital is right across the street and somebody comes up and they say, hey, Glenn, you might want to go get some stitches because you're bleeding pretty profusely. And I say, I don't want to go across the street because I'm afraid I'm going to get hit by a car on 611. That guy or that person can't promise me I'm not going to get hit by a car. 611 people go pretty fast. But the relative risk that I take by not crossing the street matters too. That is, at the, at the by, by not taking the risk of crossing the street because of my anxiety about getting hit by a car, I'm not going to get the health care or the attention that I need that could potentially save my life. Well, it wasn't just the needles, Glenn. What you had talked about when we were talking offline was the concern about the side effects. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the second dose is generally people feel a little worse the second dose. My wife actually just had her second dose and she felt for about 12 hours, kind of flu-like. She took some Motrin, she felt a little better, still didn't feel great. But then all of a sudden, almost like, you know, the lights out, it stopped and she felt fine. So um, it's hard to get a vaccine that you know might make you feel poorly. And that only happens in about 50% or so of, of second dose vaccine recipients. But even if you're one of the people that, that feels a little crummy, it's still far better to feel a little bit transiently sick and know that you're protected than to not get this vaccine at all and be open to the potential really serious ramifications of this infection. Um, I, I guess one or two other things that I'm worried about. I'm worried about alarmist or misleading information in the media, right? So this is all we seem to, to see. And I actually printed out, and this is not from fringe sources. This is from CNN Health. So this was, when was this published? A couple days ago. And it's, I, it, it just made me crazy. It says CDC uh, doesn't know um, if new COVID variants are causing rare complication in children. Well, this is, what on earth is this, right? I mean, this is sort of like saying CDC doesn't know if new COVID-19 variants cause all of your toes to fall off within five days post-infection. It's non-information, but someone could read this and say, wait a minute, the new variants are associated with some serious complication in kids? No, that's not the case. But articles like these that are misleading are also things that increase our blood pressure, increase our anxiety about this. And it, it just, it feels like in this time where there's so much information, um, this kind of information doesn't help us make decisions and move forward as a, as a society. Um, one more, um, I think when we first started doing these interviews, Jeremy, you and I, I, I mentioned that there are two viruses that are circulating. One of them is SARS and the other one is panic. And panic is still with us. It manifests in different ways. Panic at the beginning of the pandemic was, you know, everybody goes food shopping at three o'clock in the morning and washes down their green beans before they put them away. 
maybe for many of us that's ebbed and changed into something else, but um, people are so tired of, of, of all of this and so earnestly wanting to get beyond it. And many people who really want access to these vaccines that we've lost a little bit of a sense of ourselves, in my opinion, um, that our efforts to get these vaccines are, <laughs> see if this analogy makes sense, we're acting a little bit like Billy Zane in Titanic. Right? So remember this movie where Billy Zane's the, the good looking guy, but he like climbs over people or he takes somebody's kid to justify- Kate Winslet's original fiance, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, yeah, that's right. I think I do. But but people are are willing to kind of abandon who they are to get access to these vaccines. Yeah, these vaccines are huge. They're going to be helpful. But just wait your turn. When offered, say yes, and still recognize what we have in terms of treating other people respectfully. I think a better metaphor for this is, you know, you're waiting to board an airplane and um, you're waiting to board an airplane and um, they, they, they start announcing it and you're group five, but they're only boarding group one. But nevertheless, all the group five people still, you know, jam up and get in the way of the group one, two, threes and fours who are waiting to board. That plane's not leaving until everyone's on board. We're not gonna be past this until we reach herd immunity and enough of us are vaccinated. So deep breath, keep doing what you're doing as far as masks and using good judgment about who you spend time with say yes when those vaccines arrive and we're gonna, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there eventually. Uh, and one other thing, if you're frustrated, if you're bored, do something that helps, right? Give blood if you can, volunteer to work at a, uh, at a food bank. Uh, and, and maybe this is all inappropriate, right? I'm just a virologist that you get on once in a while. So if people are like, don't preach to me, I, I'll, I'll take it, I understand it. But you know, we have vaccination efforts that are happening here at Fox Chase, at Temple, we need volunteers. Sign up to help. Be part of the solution. Don't just, you know, sort of stew and fret and get in the way. I, you know, I think that's good advice. I mean, it, it's the idea that you know you can do good with your energy is certainly, certainly one that's universal coming from a virologist or anybody else. And so, as we wrap up, though, I think that was a good discussion of concerns. But do you want to? offer any predictions on when we can get back to normal? It's tricky, right? Because I think like this article, like if I say May 12th, then you know, when people are going to say, well, here's May 12th, buddy. We're, we're not back. Um, yeah. I, um, I, think, I think about this a lot. And I think I'll, I'll go ahead and make a prediction, but it's going to be predicated on two givens. First, it is gonna be really important that other vaccines get EUAs. Um, all of those vaccines for Johnson & Johnson, surely for AstraZeneca, they, they're already in a freezer, right? They don't have to wait to get EUA before they synthesize the vaccines, they're made. So the moment the EUA is approved, those vaccines can now suddenly fill the pool of vaccines that are, are distributed worldwide. It requires more doses because AstraZeneca or uh, Moderna and Pfizer can't synthesize enough of these vaccines to, to cover the world in the time frame that we needed to. So more vaccines need to get EUA. If that happens, and if to the point of my, my, my graphic that I showed earlier, if people are saying yes to vaccines as opposed to expressing vaccine hesitancy, um, and it's not my guess, this is actually just what the, the mathematical predictions um, look like, I think somewhere in the summer, um, maybe early summer, um, things will start to feel a bit more breathable. And I don't know what the word is, right? I hate the word normal. I'm not even sure I like the word pre-COVID. I don't know what things will be different. You know, I mean, one of the things that's changed is that flu, influenza rates have dropped dramatically, like by 90%. And they've dropped dramatically because we wear masks. So the flu is with us year after year. Does this mean that you know forevermore, because influenza kills people too, that wearing masks during flu season makes sense? I think that's a justifiable question to, to, to ask. Um, so I don't know if we're gonna return to something that looked like it did back in let's say January of 2020, um, but I think things are gonna start loosening up as we begin to see caseloads drop. And in fact, 
even here at the center at the health system, teams are already in place to think about when will we start relaxing some of the restrictions that are in place. So that's a good sign too. Well, we're certainly glad that you're a part of those discussions. And I think that's a, a good place to end. Um, Glenn, I'll thank you for the time you spent with us in the audience this afternoon. Thank you to the audience members for joining us. We'll be back again real soon um, with some more conversation and some more expertise as we continue uh, to go through this pandemic together. Thank you to the audience, particularly the internal audience, for everything you're doing to keep yourselves, each other, and our patients safe. Yes. Have a good one.